It's a different world than Grandpa knew as a boy. The change has reached way beyond the home, farm, and school. Business and commerce, too, have been streamlined by electric power. June, who is perhaps Grandpa's favorite, has electricity to speed her work at the bank. When she goes home from work, she rides on a silent, gliding trolley bus, almost to her own door. The house is much the same shape as the houses the Minutemen lived in, but the door leads to a different way of life. Here, light, heat, and energy to help with the housework come in by wire. Electric powers performing other unseen jobs. The water faucets are connected with a modern electrically operated water treatment plant. The garbage disposal to an electrically operated sewage plant. The amazing part of it all is the fact that the electric power they use in their home costs less than it did when Bill and Ella were married back in 1920. All in a man's lifetime, electric power has changed the world. But what about the world that Fred Wilson's granddaughter will see? The world of tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring innovations like the heat pump, which electrically heats your house in winter and cools it in summer. Even in winter, there is always heat in the air, the soil, and the water below ground level. During the cold months, the heat pump withdraws warmth from outside to heat your home. In summer, it operates much like your electric refrigerator, withdrawing and expelling heat from the inside air to provide cooling comfort. And what of atomic energy? Chances are, there will never be a handy home-size atomic pile in your basement. But experiments are already underway that point to atomic power plants like this. The intense heat generated in an atomic pile produces steam to drive a battery of turbine generators. Thus, the mysterious force of nuclear fission is converted into the familiar, flexible, electric power. Beyond atomic energy, there is another limitless, undeveloped source of power. The energy in sunlight falling on the U.S. daily is more than enough to supply all our requirements for food, heat, and light to power our transportation and manufacturing. Today, we use sunlight stored in coal, once lush green vegetation, or the force of falling water whose cycle is motivated by the sun. But locked in every growing plant is a mysterious process known as photosynthesis, nature's way of turning light into chemical energy. Science is patiently unlocking the secrets of photosynthesis, and we may well see an era wherein solar energy, like atomic energy, may be put to work as electric power. But there are electrical innovations long past the experimental stage. Look. Already it is tomorrow. Welcome to an electrical home of the future, a new concept for living, whose elements are all practical possibilities now. Come in. Here is a living room with no wasted space. For centuries, the fireplace has been the center of attraction. So here we have incorporated the modern age point of interest, the television set. This room, like the rest of the house, is light conditioned. Carefully planned lighting based on research and installed with a relay operated remote control wiring system. This inexpensive system permits starting breakfast coffee by pressing a bedside switch. Turning off the radio with a switch near the telephone. Lights can be turned on ahead and turned off behind you as you walk through the rooms. Just off the living room is the electric kitchen, organized to save steps, time, and energy. The combination soda fountain and snack bar adjoins the electric laundry where clothes can be washed, rinsed, dried, and ironed. Incorporated in the snack bar is the electric sink, 
with a disposal and dishwasher. Here is greater freedom from drudgery than ever before. Indoor weather of this new world home is provided by the heat pump. A concept of living for the future, yes. But all components of this dream home are being manufactured today. Tomorrow, they can be part of your home too. But for us, the wonders of tomorrow and the way of life we have achieved depend on freedom to build and grow, on the personal liberty that inspired the men of Lexington. But now our freedoms are threatened by forces that would crush our liberties and tyrannize the minds of men. Against these forces, we have the weapons of freedom. Courage, faith, and the creative spirit. And we have the tool that built our way of life, productivity. America, with only 6% of the world's population, produces over 40% of the world's goods. How can such a small percentage of the world's people produce so much? Here is one important reason. Every worker has at his command an invisible battalion. Who are they? Listen, a one horsepower motor can do the muscle work of 17 men. In 1940, the average American worker had four horsepower of electrical energy, or the equivalent of nearly 70 invisible workers at his command. By 1950, 10 short years later, this number had more than doubled. There were on the job with him over 150 unseen workers, and the ranks of these invisible battalions keep growing. With this productivity, we can add to our freedoms and defend them. For the future, the challenge is clear. We must keep building our productivity to strengthen freedom at home and halt the tyranny abroad. If we are now able to multiply the efforts of every workman 150 times with only eight horsepower of electric power, why not still more horsepower? Why not 200, 300, 500 invisible workers on the job? As the Minutemen laid down their plows and took up their guns at the first alarm, we too must guard for ourselves and for future generations the liberties that enabled us to build and grow. Today, freedom and power are woven together. The invisible battalions of electric power turn out autos and airplanes, household goods and guided missiles to preserve our freedoms for the greater world to come. But we are not a nation of destroyers. We are builders. Builders of new freedoms and more power for a new age. We stand on the edge of that new age even now. And the pioneering spirit, flowering in the air of freedom, will dream and build new ways to put electric power to work. Then in time we may come to know that the men of Lexington set off a chain reaction, burgeoning down the years to make this world a freer world for all mankind. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams.
The present and the unborn generation of the United States and the world are heirs to one of the greatest energy discoveries of man, nuclear energy. Accompanying the tremendous advantages of this discovery are certain potential risks to health and life. As small as these risks are, the government has the responsibility of assuring that the health and lives of people are protected while the advantages of nuclear energy are being developed. Nuclear energy has already been put to use in many ways as a source of heat for production of light and power. In cities, in industry, and for the propulsion of ships, it is used for experimental purposes in agriculture and to develop stronger strains of disease and weather-resistant food crops. Another great area of development for nuclear energy is, of course, medical research. Radioiodine has been found to be an effective treatment for hyperthyroidism, to give but one example. It is used for the control or relief of some diseases, and these uses will, of course, be greatly extended and improved in time. New programs of the Atomic Energy Commission and other agencies are designed to expand the usefulness of nuclear energy. Before work is begun on any of these programs, the government thoroughly evaluates the health and safety factors, often for several years, until it is assured that the project Three major programs planned are, one, aerospace nuclear reactor tests, two, the plowshare program for the peaceful uses of nuclear explosives, and three, the seismic research program for the detection of underground nuclear detonations. The first of these programs, the aerospace nuclear reactor test at the Nevada test site, includes the development of a nuclear engine to propel rockets into outer space and the development of a reactor for use in a nuclear ramjet engine to power a vehicle at supersonic speeds within the atmosphere. The plowshare program covers several different fields. One is the development of a new source of power to supplement the rapidly diminishing supply of oil, coal and gas. Today, reactor plants can provide an alternate source of power from nuclear energy. However, this power is now expensive because of the initial cost of the plants. In the Atomic Energy Commission's effort to find additional sources of power, one of the plowshares experiments involves investigation of the problems in the underground storage of heat produced by nuclear explosions. and the recovery of this energy to provide electrical power, industrial expansion. Other objectives of the plowshare program are to study the possibility of producing isotopes in these underground explosions, to aid in the economical recovery of minerals upon which the expanding industries of the world depend, and to explore safety techniques and economic feasibility of using nuclear explosions for excavation purposes in the building of harbors and canals. The seismic research program is designed to improve methods of detecting and identifying underground detonations by seismic recordings and to determine the wave ray patterns in the immediate vicinity of the site and at other stations in the seismic network. To differentiate between underground explosions, earthquakes, or subterranean tremors of similar intensity is a major difficulty. For an informal review of nuclear radiations and their effect on humans, a sunlit pool with all the trimmings serves as a suitable launching spot, offering an approach that is sufficiently scientific and scenic. A sunbather exposes herself to an assortment of radiations, 
Some, such as the solar rays, are heaven sent. Others are nuclear, the same as those which come from an atomic burst, and they're bombarding her from all sides from the sky in the form of cosmic rays, from radon, a material in the atmosphere, from radioactive uranium found in the water which she just left, and in the earth on which she now lies. They aren't powerful enough to bother our bather. They're less of a hazard than the rays of the sun, which, if carelessly taken, can become too much of a good thing. With all radiations, nuclear and otherwise, it depends on the duration and intensity of the exposure. Nuclear radiations have their novel way of causing injury, but it's neither mysterious nor inescapable. Radioactivity, as represented by the ball, causes electrons to be ejected from their atom. It's an offensive move based on ionization. Ionization disrupts the structure of atoms of which all living matter is composed. An atom is part of a molecule, and molecules are part of the cell. The cell is the structural and functional unit of all living matter, a tiny machine with a basic job to do. Cells operating with thousands of other cells of various shapes and performing special chores make up tissues and organs. Organs are departments in a complex factory, the human body which is engaged in the manufacture of an important product, life. An atom then seems unimportant and infinitesimal, a tiny cog on a small wheel in a miniature machine, which, if multiplied millions of times, forms the going concern that is you. But if enough of the cogs are broken through ionizing radiation, the gears grind, the machines falter and stop, the factory shuts down. Each of the four kinds of missiles discharged by radioactive substances has its own ballistic behavior. To observe them attacking the body, they must be symbolized far out of proportion, magnified millions of times. Gamma rays are the most penetrating, but the least ionizing. Not so penetrating, but more ionizing, are neutrons, which are not rays, but particles. Neutrons and gamma rays are external dangers, able to shoot into the human body easily. Alpha particles cannot penetrate the skin. Beta particles can cause surface burns if the assault is sufficiently concentrated and sustained. Both are able to gain entry through the eating and breathing of radioactive matter or via breaks in the skin. Once inside, this so-called hot stuff takes up residence in various parts of the body, giving off highly ionizing alpha and beta particles. And how long does this radio rat race go on? The body will succeed in casting off some of this material, but it is a long, slow process. There's no effective method for dislodging the stuff. No known way of neutralizing or destroying it. There is no method of hastening its half-life which is the time required for 50% of the substance to decay. With some substances, it is a matter of less than a second. But if you had some plutonium inside you, you wouldn't make any plans to celebrate the event. Plutonium's half-life is 24,000 years. The various kinds of cells which make up the parts of the body differ in their vulnerability to radiation. Most sensitive are lymph cells, such as those found in the tonsils. Next is bone marrow, which manufactures red and white blood cells. Then the sex cells, followed by tendons and cartilage, as in the nose. Muscles and nerves, the toughest of all. In general, cells which reproduce rapidly and whose efficient functioning depends on that ability are most effective. Radiation halts the reproduction, which is a simple process of one cell dividing into two. This destructiveness has been harnessed and put to work in the radium treatment of cancer, which consists of cells that have gone wild and multiplied too fast. 
The manifestations of radiation in the body are many and range from slight to severe. Loss of hair, nausea, bleeding, inability of the body to resist other ailments and make its own repairs. These are some of them. And they may be climaxed by the ultimate symptom, death itself. However, complete recovery is more probable. The illness runs a course from causes to effects. Much of the mystery surrounding it is maintained by the general public, which is determined to regard radioactivity as potent and irresistible as the evil spirits of the Indians. This can be partly explained by man's fear of dangers he cannot sense. A fear fanned into widespread misunderstanding and by sensational speculation on what radiation can do. Radioactivity is dangerous, but to say that it's deadly, period, is as misleading as giving a flat answer to the question, how high is up? You're watching Sleep Corps, media for insomnia. an atom, as scientists simplify it for us. So incredibly small, we will never see one. Yet the atom is mainly empty space, with electrons whirling around the nucleus. But man succeeded in smashing the tiny subatomic nucleus, releasing enormous and unprecedented amounts of energy. War and peace were revolutionized at the dawn of the atomic age. Our solar system in the universe around us, also mainly empty space, so vast it staggers human comprehension. Still, man is now conquering this vastness Strange devices float in the emptiness between our Earth and the planets. Men walk in space. Science fiction becomes science fact. As more ambitious space feats take shape on the drawing boards, one need becomes imperative. More power. So, the experts of space rendezvoused with the masters of the subatomic world. For only the atom can satisfy some of the future power needs for space exploration. One has to use the tiniest fragments in nature to reach into the vastness of the universe. Nuclear energy is being developed for our space program in two basic applications. First, for nuclear space propulsion, the nuclear rocket. Secondly, in special power plants, which can provide the electricity essential for every spacecraft where solar energy is unsuitable. First, the atomic rocket. The fireworks invented by the Chinese and their monumental descendants used for space travel have one thing in common. Like the motor of a car, they work by the internal combustion engine principle. Thrust is produced by energy liberated when the chemicals burn. They are called chemical rockets. Gases expanding and rushing through the open end of the engine provide thrust. The same principle holds true for both the liquid and solid fuel systems. The performance of chemical rockets has doubled during the past two decades and their growth is now leveling off. 
but the source of power that will provide performance greater than today's most advanced chemical rocket engine is the nuclear rocket engine. An engine based on the fantastic energy of the atom, of nuclear fuel, essential for flights of our astronauts to Mars, Venus, and beyond. Essential for auxiliary power to operate a base on the moon. The nuclear rocket does not burn fuel in the same way that chemical rockets do. Instead, it carries the lightest of all elements, liquid hydrogen, as a propellant. The heat source is an atomic furnace, a nuclear reactor. It heats, vaporizes, and expands the propellant, and expels it from a nozzle to produce thrust. The nuclear rocket has advantages over the chemical propulsion engine for trips into deep space. The specific impulse or efficiency of a nuclear rocket can be two or more times greater than that of a chemical rocket. This will result in a great reduction in the weight of the propulsion system for the same payload. For some missions, millions of pounds less than chemical rockets permitting the nuclear rocket to outdistance the chemical rocket. Today, space objectives can be accomplished by the chemical combustion rocket. But the power requirements of some future space missions will be made possible by atomic energy. The nuclear engine is versatile. It can shut off and restart as desired and the amount of its thrust can be regulated to meet mission requirements. The heat in the nuclear reactor is produced by the action of tiny bullet-like neutrons, the electrically neutral parts of the atomic nucleus. When a neutron strikes an atomic nucleus, the nucleus may split, releasing at the same time radiation and heat. In the process, additional neutrons may hit other nuclei and build up a chain reaction that can yield tremendous amounts of usable heat out of small amounts of nuclear fuel. Uranium is the most practical fuel for this purpose. Since slow-moving neutrons are more likely to cause a chain reaction than fast-moving neutrons, moderating materials are used to slow them down. The reactor's activity is started, stopped, increased and decreased by the use of neutron stopping materials such as cadmium or boron. Reflector material such as beryllium that bounces escaping neutrons back into the active area greatly increases activity. Now to take advantage of the tremendous heat created by the fission process the propellant hydrogen is forced through the hot core. As it absorbs heat, the gas expands to a veritable hydrogen hurricane, exerting thrust as it is forced out of the nozzle. Since the hydrogen expands to produce thrust and does not burn, it is not necessary to carry oxygen to support combustion. While the theoretical advantages of the nuclear rocket are impressive, the practical applications offer great challenges. The scientists and engineers of the Atomic Energy Commission and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration combined forces to meet these challenges. The name of the program, Rover. These nuclear rockets will be used in space as upper stage on vehicles boosted from the Earth with chemical rockets. The men who design and build the nuclear rocket are looking ahead to the time when our nation's space vehicles will be used for extended manned lunar operations, for manned planetary exploration, and unmanned deep space probes. From the nuclear rocket, we turn now to the atomic electrical power plants. Spacecraft need electricity to satisfy the demands of the various subsystems. 
The need for a continuous supply of electrical power is especially great in manned space vehicles with their complex life support systems. Radio and television receivers and transmitters, telemetry devices, computers, and other scientific instruments. This power may be provided by batteries with relatively brief lifespans or solar cells which have their limitations. For example, solar cells, because they can only be energized by the sun, cannot operate on the shadow side of the moon. Or they may be damaged when the craft passes through radiation areas, such as the Van Allen belt. Also, as spacecraft become larger, they require higher capacity power sources. At these higher power levels, atomic energy will be especially useful. Two different types of atomic power sources have already been launched to power spacecraft. The radioisotopic generator, known as the atomic battery, and the atomic power reactor, the isotopic generator. This satellite launch in 1961 made history the first use of atomic power in space. Still operating, the satellite carries a radioisotope generator as a supplementary source of electricity for its radio transmitters. This first space generator, about the size and shape of a grapefruit, weighs about five pounds. Its rated output is about 2.7 watts. Radioisotopes of an element release energetic particles. When they are stopped in the surrounding material, they produce heat. Heat is converted into electricity. This is accomplished by a series of thermocouples, each of which converts heat directly into a small amount of electricity. When two dissimilar metals are joined in a closed circuit and the two junctions are kept at different temperatures, an electric current is generated. There are no moving parts. Here is a series of thermocouples as used in an isotopic generator. Ultimately, the lifetime of such a unit is limited only by the length of effectiveness of the atomic fuel. That may last years, as in the case of this isotopic unit to operate a remote weather station. Under most circumstances, the life of an isotopic unit is much longer than the life of a chemical battery or solar cells. When space vehicles become larger, Isotopic generators will become relatively less economical. The larger nuclear demands can be met by an auxiliary power reactor. The principle of creating heat is similar to the method used by the space propulsion reactor. Only in this case, the reactor and power generator are much smaller, such as this 970 pound SNAP 10A reactor power system. In this case, the heat produced by nuclear reaction is converted directly into about 500 watts of electricity by 1440 thermocouples. April 3rd, 1965. The first time a reactor was put in orbit. During its operation in orbit, the atomic reactor produced 500,000 watt-hours of electricity. An exact copy of this flight unit completed more than a year of successful, uninterrupted testing on the ground. Eventually, reactors of this type will produce much more power for the same weight. Reactor systems of the future will provide housekeeping power for observation and weather satellites, orbiting laboratories, and communication systems sending signals directly to your radios and TV sets 
on the ground. In other types of space auxiliary power reactors, the conversion to electrical power will be accomplished by heat exchangers, feeding a conventional turbo generator. Astronauts of the future will travel in spacecraft propelled by nuclear rockets. The huge array of instruments and control devices in their spacecraft and in those they will leave in space, on the moon, and on other distant places in our solar system, will receive electricity from nuclear power generators. Men in space through the magic of the atom. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. closest neighbor to Earth, presently the focus of man's greatest scientific adventure, the first celestial body that will be explored by man. Landing men on the moon will be a truly great achievement, but only the beginning of a new era in space exploration. No one can predict the exact missions that will follow in the years and decades ahead. But the most exciting possibilities will require the acceleration and deceleration of very heavy loads, such as the maneuvering of large Earth orbiting spacecraft. The transportation of large amounts of equipment and supplies to the lunar surface. And the sending of heavy spacecraft to the planets. Today's missions are being accomplished with rockets that burn chemical fuels. But chemical fuels are heavy, and the cost of putting each pound into Earth orbit is very high. Nuclear rockets, when perfected, can provide the same propulsion energy with less overall weight. They will expand our ability to explore space. This is the story. is Saturn V, the most powerful launch vehicle being built by the United States, a three-stage rocket that will place the Apollo spacecraft in the vicinity of the moon. The total weight of Saturn V is about six million pounds. Its three stages have chemical engines that burn fuel to generate thrust. The first and second stages provide most of the energy needed to put the third stage and the payload, about a quarter of a million pounds, into Earth orbit. At present, only chemical rockets can provide the high thrust needed to do this job. The third stage accelerates the payload to the velocity needed to get it to its destination. Here travel time and payload weight are determined by the efficiency with which the propellant is converted into thrust. By substituting a nuclear third stage for Saturn V, the velocity of a given payload can be greatly increased, cutting travel time for some missions in half. This is particularly important in sending deep space probes to Jupiter and beyond. 
or if shortening travel time is not essential, propellant weight can be traded off for an increased payload weight. This is important for a lunar supply mission, Earth orbital operations, and some unmanned missions to the planets. Why is the nuclear rocket so much better than the chemical rocket? In rocket propulsion, exhaust velocity determines propulsion efficiency. At a given temperature, the lighter the exhaust gas, the higher the exhaust velocity. And the higher the exhaust velocity, the more thrust is generated for each pound of propellant consumed per second. The nuclear rocket merely heats hydrogen, the lightest element of all, and expels it at tremendous velocity. Chemical rockets burn fuel to produce exhaust gases that contain heavier elements. So at the same exhaust temperature, the exhaust velocity is much lower, and each pound consumed per second produces less thrust. Rocket efficiency is stated in seconds of specific impulse. This refers to the time in seconds that one pound of propellant will deliver one pound of thrust. The higher the seconds of specific impulse, the greater the propellant economy. Our best chemical rockets of today are limited to a specific impulse of about 450 seconds, and only slight improvement can be expected. On the other hand, full-scale nuclear reactor tests have achieved 800 seconds, and laboratory tests promise even more, perhaps as much as 900 seconds. This means the nuclear rocket, with its lightweight, high-velocity exhaust, will use propellant about twice as efficiently as chemical rockets. This, then, is the principal advantage of nuclear propulsion. Someday, a manned trip to Mars and return may become the mission assignment. Exactly how it would be carried out depends upon a number of factors. But here is one way it might be done with nuclear rocket propulsion, using the technology developed for earlier missions. Using several Saturn V launch vehicles, components of the huge spacecraft would be placed into Earth orbit and assembled. Separate nuclear stages might be provided for each major step of the mission. The first stage might consist of three clustered rockets for departure from Earth orbit. Two other nuclear stages consisting of one engine each would be used in the vicinity of Mars. The first stage cluster fires to accelerate the spacecraft to the velocity needed to get to Mars in the time that was decided upon, say 200 days. At burnout, the first stage cluster is jettisoned and goes into orbit around the sun. Mid-course correction is made by chemical rockets. About 200 days later, the space vehicle approaches Mars. There it is slowed down by a single nuclear rocket and enters an orbit around the planet. The used second stage is put into a higher Mars orbit than the space vehicle. A chemically powered module departs for the planet's surface. For the first time, men from Earth will set foot on another planet. For the return trip, the module is lifted by chemical power back into a Mars orbit, where it docks with the main space vehicle. The men transfer to the main craft and jettison the module, leaving it in an orbit around Mars. A third nuclear rocket accelerates the vehicle for the return trip. And it is jettisoned. Again, mid-course correction is made chemically. Just before reaching the vicinity of Earth, the crew transfers to a re-entry vehicle and jettisons the large spacecraft. Chemical rockets slow down the vehicle to re-entry speed and they are jettisoned.
After deceleration through the atmosphere, the re-entry vehicle returns to the Earth's surface by parachute. A trip to Mars and back, for centuries a dream of Earth-bound men, is now much closer to reality. Of course, there are many, many other problems to be solved before such advanced space missions can be attempted. Life support systems for extended space journeys, more accurate space navigation, communication systems, power supplies, and so forth. But any successful advanced mission must begin with propulsion, the power to get there and back. Lower overall weight, larger payloads, shorter travel time. These are the chief advantages of nuclear propulsion. The technology needed to build a nuclear rocket is well advanced. It will be available when this nation determines its next great objective in space. <laughs>